Now here are Judith Stamper and Harry Gration with Tuesday's edition of Look North. Tonight's headlines, six people die in road accidents in Yorkshire. The unhealthy North, disturbing statistics from a new government report. And 20,000 Christians celebrate Easter at Butland in Skegness. Good evening. Six people died in three separate road accidents in Yorkshire today. A man and a woman were killed in Sheffield when their Cortina went out of control in Peniston Road and they were flung from the car. Two other people had to be cut free and are seriously hurt. A teenager died on the M62 and three people were killed in an accident near Harrogate. Sue Crabtree reports. A smashed clock in the Chrysler horizon pinpointed the accident at Kirby Overblow near Harrogate at 6.55 this morning. The car had been travelling towards Leeds on the A61 when it's thought it hit a ditch and was catapulted several yards into a field. A motorist rang police who found the bodies of the three back passengers, a woman and two men, lying on the grass. They'd been flung out of the rear windscreen. The two men in the front were taken to Harrogate District Hospital with slight injuries and shock, and they've now been discharged. Meanwhile, police faced the gruesome job of checking the wreckage and contents to try to find the cause of the tragedy. Well, at this stage, it's pure speculation, but it appears the cars travel from Harrogate, lost control on this series of bends, gone off the road, and collided with the hedge and fence, causing the car to flip up in the air and somersault into the field behind us. Investigations into the cause continue. The wreckage was taken away for closer analysis. The M62 near the Lofthouse turn-off in West Yorkshire saw the third fatal accident at about 10.30. Firemen used inflated airbags to free a teenager and his father, trapped when their Land Rover and trailer overturned on the eastbound carriageway and landed on its roof. The 16-year-old boy, Jonathan Whiteley, from West Ardsley, died from his injuries. His father, Derek, is in Pinderfields Hospital, where he's said to be comfortable. The tragedy of 11-year-old Amanda Smith, the Wakefield schoolgirl who was strangled by her mother while under the supervision of the social services, could not have been prevented, according to an independent inquiry. Wakefield Council's Social Services Committee today heard that nobody could have predicted the girl's death last March. John Thurwell reports. Amanda Smith was strangled at a time when Wakefield Social Services were regularly visiting the family home as part of routine supervision of underprivileged families going through a divorce. Mother Linda Tandy, who confessed to the killing, was an alcoholic. She was to tell the court Amanda had been sexually assaulted by her stepfather. Today's independent inquiry casts no blame on the social worker in whose charge Amanda was. In fact, Alan Crowther was praised for his conscientious and caring work on behalf of the child. Nobody knew that the girl had been abused at all. So how did the report's author, an expert on child abuse, explain Amanda's death? No, no case involving child protection can any social services do everything perfectly. We are working in very difficult circumstances with very serious social problems and issues, in particular here, issues around alcoholism. It was a tragedy that happened. But one that couldn't have been foreseen? It could not, in my view, have been predicted or prevented by any social services department. Second. Wakefield Council has recently voted for 16 more social worker jobs to be created to improve the authorities' service. If Amanda's death has proved anything, it is that social workers are being faced with an almost impossible task in protecting children who are vulnerable inside the family. Amanda was killed in an outburst of violence that no one could have foreseen. Had we known that she was being sexually abused, then things may have turned out differently. The answer, according to the social services director here, is for more training and more social workers. But he warned that tragedies like that of Amanda can never be entirely prevented. The largest rail union is predicting there will be 5,000 more job losses at BR engineering plants, including many in our region. 
The National Union of Railwomen's prediction is based on a leaked British Rail document which allegedly outlines plans for the future. Mike McCarthy reports. There have already been almost 2,000 job losses at British Rail engineering plants in Yorkshire over the past two years, most at Doncaster and York. The NUR now fears there'll be around 5,000 more nationally if plans in the leaked document are implemented. According to the union, those plans include a map of 14 depots which will be upgraded to super depots in part of a large-scale shake-up of the service. Two are in our region, Leeds and, ironically, Doncaster. But, says the union, work will be moved away from smaller depots such as Sheffield, Nottingham, Immingham and Hull. BR Engineering says the union's claims of 5,000 job losses are absolute nonsense. BREL concedes 900 jobs will go over the next three years, a fact made known more than a year ago. But the NUR stands by its claims. We've known that there is going to be redundancies in, in other engineering sectors of the industry long before they've been honest enough to come forward and tell us. So for the board to turn around and say that it's basically scaremongering, it's, it's nothing of the sort. I, I think you will find that as, as the events develop that we will be found to be correct again. If you are correct, what does it mean first for the employees of British Rail and secondly for the passengers? Well. Firstly, what it means, again, is that we're going to have thousands of rare women and women with the threat of, the, of, of dismissals hanging over their heads. Nobody will know when they're actually going to come, but we will know that they will come. And, of course, again, for the travelling public, what it means is there's going to be less maintenance facilities, which means that we will have more and more failures. That will uh, create a, a, a downward pattern as far as the service that they're going to receive. Whatever the leaked document may show about BR's future, its effect on industrial relations at the present has been decidedly negative. Former newsreader Angela Rippon and rail workers leader Ray Buxton have backed the nuclear dump protests at Fulbeck, Fulbeck in Lincolnshire, despite being independent directors of the nuclear waste agency Nirex. And they even paid their £1 subscription to the campaign. Paul McRae reports. Dozens of villagers were waiting for the TV presenter and the union leader at the appointed time, at the appointed place. The police were there, so were journalists, so was the Grim Reaper. They were all too late. The Nirex party had arrived an hour and a quarter early. The protesters' leader would have a few things to show them. Well, there's a borehole there that was drilled at the end of January, and the water has been flowing upwards, it's artesian water, has been flowing upwards ever since. Um, so the question really is, are we to be the first country in the world to uh, bury nuclear waste in, in amongst artesian water? Because we really will be a first there. Inside the airfield, he and they examined that borehole. They spent two hours on the site, one of four places the independent directors Buckton and Rippon will visit before they tell the rest of the Nirex board which, if any, should be chosen to bury the waste. At the local pub, the local people had put on a spread and had their first chance to talk to the visitors. They were to be pleasantly surprised. From what you've seen, do you think that they ought to dump the waste here at Fulbeck? I'm not going into where it should be dumped and where it shouldn't do. I've told these people very clearly where I stand. It's got to be put in a place where it's acceptable to the public and where it is safe and it can be examined hundreds of years hence. He then shocked and delighted the demonstrators by becoming one of them. He paid his pound and became a paid-up member of the anti-nuclear group Land, Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire against nuclear dumping. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Good. Inside the pub, it became clear the other Nirex director had joined Land as well. I think on an occasion like this, um, on a day like this, that it was actually the right kind of thing to do. The protesters don't expect to see the two new members at their meetings, but they're happy to have them on their side. Nirex says it's surprised at what would appear to be defections. In the end, the gesture could rebound both on Mr Buckton and Miss Rippon. It might also rebound on the people of Fullback. It may well be that members of an anti-nuclear lobby choose the village as a nuclear dump site. West Yorkshire Police have decided not to prosecute Ron Smith, the man who claims that the hoax Yorkshire Ripper tape was made by police officers. Mr Smith, himself a former policeman, came to prominence after leading a one-man investigation into the death of his daughter Helen in Saudi Arabia. He made his allegations about the tape in a Sunday newspaper, 
But today, police said his claims were groundless. Mike McCarthy reports. Luke's tape convinced experienced policemen that the so-called Yorkshire Ripper was from the northeast. It included detail about the attacks which police were certain only the murderer knew. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. The Sunday Express recently published Mr Smith's allegations in an article claiming the hoaxer was a policeman disillusioned with the investigation. But today, West Yorkshire police said those claims were groundless. There is no evidence whatsoever to indicate that a police officer was responsible for making the hoax tapes. As far as you're concerned now, are you planning to take this matter further? No, we have considered the fact that Mr Smith made his original comments to a newspaper reporter, that that reporter... Uh, wrote an article which was subsequently edited and published in the Sunday Express newspaper and having considered all the circumstances uh, we intend to leave the matter as it is. This afternoon Ron Smith refused to add to his allegations but he said he stood by his earlier claims. An 87 year old man is said to be poorly in Sheffield's Royal Hallenshire Hospital after a fire at his home in Darnell. Harold Martin had 20% burns to his body and is suffering from the effects of smoke. An investigation is underway after a Sheffield workman died while installing street lighting in East Anglia. Contractor John Roberts, who was 49 of Whiteways Drive in Sheffield, collapsed as he was connecting the electricity supply to a lamp post. A police spokesman said a post-mortem is to be carried out, but it seems certain Mr Roberts was electrocuted. Minibus services operated by Yorkshire Rider should be back to normal in the morning after a walkout by drivers earlier today. The entire fleet of 100 minibuses based in Leeds was off the road for the whole of the day in a dispute about overtime payments. The striking drivers had turned down a one-off payment of £50 and want time and a half for overtime and Saturday working. Drivers in Halifax and Bradford who have accepted the offer were working normally today. Renishaw Park Colliery near Chesterfield has been at a standstill all day following a walkout by miners in a dispute over working practices. So far, about 2,000 tonnes of coal has been lost. However, at Warsop Colliery, also in North Derbyshire, work resumed today after a strike over incentive payments for surface workers and some underground works. British Coal say about £100,000 worth of production was lost. The Seven Trent Water Authority has announced a multi-million pounds programme to improve services over the next five years. It will include laying about 200 miles of new mains and installing new sewage systems. The search was called off today for a 58-year-old Gainsborough man who fell into the River Trent while walking along a plank between two moored boats. Police divers spent eight hours searching for John Collier but had to give up when underwater visibility got down to only two feet. Three of the region's cricketers are in the MCC side to play Champions Essex next week. The Yorkshire batsman Ashley Metcalf, Derbyshire's John Morris and 21-year-old Paul Jarvis, the promising Yorkshire fast bowler who took more than 60 wickets last season. Boxing and Tom Collins, the British light heavyweight champion from Leeds, has been named as the next challenger to European title holder Alex Blanchard of Holland. The fight is scheduled for May the 30th, but the venue is still to be decided. The high rate of heart disease suffered by people in this region compared with the rest of the United Kingdom is highlighted in a report prepared to coincide with a new government health campaign. The campaign called Look After Your Heart is being launched next week by the Health Secretary, Norman Fowler, with the help of Junior Health Minister, Mrs Edwina Curry. Nick Wood has been examining the background to the new initiative. Region by region, the North and specifically Yorkshire figure at the top of the league for coronary disease fatalities. Experts say diet has a lot to do with it. Fatty foods, smoking and a lack of exercise are pinpointed as causes. Ward 5 at Killingbeck Hospital in Leeds, which caters for people undergoing heart surgery. 147,000 people in England die from the disease every year, according to a report prepared to coincide with the start of the Look After Your Heart campaign. Women are also at risk, says the report. They now make up a third of all heart disease deaths of people under 75. Now, what I want you to do is really concentrate on the two major arteries there. Medical students at Killingbeck are shown a cine x-ray film of a diseased heart. The picture shows the small arteries, which when narrowed cause angina and when blocked cause a heart attack. Doctors say in this region it's far too common a problem. There's a very severe narrowing, almost a complete obstruction to the flow, 
midway down this artery. Now in this sort of case here, all of the territory of the heart that's supplied by the artery down here is short of blood. And in these sort of circumstances, it's not surprising the patient has a lot of chest pain. It is a disease which will, to some extent, catch up with most of us eventually as we retire. But the problem that we're really concerned about is the fact that this disease uh, strikes particularly at working men, and it is the only disease now, really, that stops us living longer than our forefathers did. Now, first of all, we'll pop these electrodes on. The question is what to do about heart disease. Here, a patient undergoes a special exercise to try and analyze whether he's suffering from a coronary problem. Surveys show a significant number of men and women in this country take no recreational exercise at all. Health campaigns in other countries have proved successful in re-educating people. Looking to the future, many experts favor a screening process to predict coronary disease. Until then, though, self-discipline is the most effective prevention. I think many people feel that it won't happen to them. It's always going to be somebody else. But unfortunately, it does happen to them. So the first thing is an awareness, and also an awareness of what can anyone do to sensibly try and postpone or delay this terrible problem. And that really means watching one's diet, because diet is very important, particularly the consumption of fatty, animal fatty foods. Smoking, of course, everyone knows and should avoid. Then the question of uh, reasonable amounts of exercise and so forth. So there are a number of factors which people can take sensible precautions on. Um, and, and undoubtedly that is beneficial. When the government campaign is launched next week, it will involve new initiatives in industry and the community, with the hope of reducing the cost in human and financial terms of heart disease. And I hope you weren't having chips for your tea. The Butlins Holiday Camp in Skegness, originally built back in the 30s, reopened this week after a £15 million facelift. The first visitors moved in at the weekend, but they were holidaymakers with a bit of a difference. 20,000 Christians celebrating Easter in a festival of music and prayer called the Spring Harvest. Peter Pitt sends us this report. Even after its multi-million pound refurbishment, Butlins Skegness still has a whiff of nostalgia. However, alongside the unmistakable chalets are some very expensive additions, like the £6 million Fun Splash swimming complex. The familiar red coats are there all right, but in its first week there have already been some radical departures from the Butlins tradition. The bars are firmly closed for one thing, and there's gospel music coming from the speakers. This is Spring Harvest, an interdenominational religious festival attended by 20,000, to say the least, exuberant Christians. So great are their numbers, they've even erected their own big top to cater for prayer and song meetings of 5,000. Shout for joy, for the Lord is good. Just and true in all his ways. The spring harvest is about um, the fact that the Church of Jesus Christ is not buildings where you have 15th century buildings with 12th century people singing modern versions of the hymns, but it's about relationships, people learning to have a relationship with God and learning to have a relationship with each other. And we have here on Butlin's site, we have all the facility for the play dimension as well as the serious prayer dimension as well. The serious dimension involves, among other things, a remarkable space age project called Tomorrow, where white coated assistants introduce Christian cadets to training for the worldwide battle against evil and deprivation. Next door, 607 to 9 year olds are engaged in their own session. Choosing between the seminars and the sing alongs is the first task for this group from St Andrew's Church in Harrogate. How to encourage your local leadership by John and Christine Noble in the Empire Theatre for our. They'll also be indulging in some water sports at the multi-million pound Fun Splash.
people get the wrong idea. You know, obviously prayer and fellowship and praise is, is, takes, you know, a large proportion of the time. But Christians are here to celebrate and to laugh and to, to share and have a nice time and enjoy themselves as well. There were a very few whose exuberance had spilt over into their dress and makeup, but the sentiment was the same. What I'm doing here right now is um, praising God and claiming the ground for Him. What I'm doing at Spring Harvest this week is coming to learn more about Him. And I just want to be part of this march so that Satan won't have any authority here, and so that every single person that's here this week will have a chance to hear what God has to say to them. Twenty thousand people enjoying themselves. What's been called the biggest ever convention of scarecrows, yes, scarecrows, is to be held on Easter Monday at the Yorkshire Museum of Farming near York. Today was preview day for the world's press and television crews. Ken Cooper was there too. It was a sight to gladden the heart of Wurzel Gummidge himself. A small army of scarecrows, lovingly constructed by schoolchildren to a variety of extravagant designs. Most of the scarecrows were decidedly better dressed than their counterparts working out in the fields. We were unable to obtain the expert opinion of the crows themselves, as they'd appear to have boycotted the place in protest. The ducks, though, weren't scared at all. Nevertheless, the idea of a scarecrow festival is a novel one. So what, we wondered, was the thinking behind it? This was a, a project sponsored by the Tourism Department of Rydale District Council. They invited all the primary schools in that district to build scarecrows as a project. We thought it was a very good idea at the end of the project to bring them here and have them, them on display and have this festival over this Easter bank holiday weekend. Is that because scarecrows get lonely? <laughs> That's a leading question, Ken. Uh, I suppose they do. So we've brought them here today and we have a fairly large number of them uh, on this preview day and they'll be here this weekend. What does the future hold for them then? Uh, not, not too much of a future because in fact uh, most scarecrows are really only purchased for the birds to sit upon. So in fact we have here uh, some very modern ones and they, they do in fact scare the birds away. Since the affair is sponsored by the National Farmers Union, the scarecrows will be going out into the fields of North Yorkshire to work for their living. Well, most of them will. <laughs> they didn't have to go as far as York to film it, actually. Just have a look at the newsroom conference in the morning. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Now the weather, and Mr C.E. Sellers of Scarborough sent in this photo of springtime for York Minster, and it's a pleasant forecast for tomorrow. Most of the evening and night will be dry but mild with some patchy mist and fog. It'll remain frost-free with temperatures no lower than 8 Celsius 46 Fahrenheit and light winds mainly from the southwest. Tomorrow morning, mist and cloud will thin to give another dry day with a good deal of sunshine, temperatures reaching 17 Celsius 63 Fahrenheit. To sum up, tonight mainly dry and mild with patchy fog, Tomorrow, dry and warm with some sunshine. <laughs>